give it one more minute here. I don't see Joel quite yet. John Rick told us he wasn't going to be here and you're the guy today. That's correct. Uh, we'll we'll do our best. All right. Well, I have 3:30, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Am I correct um, that uh, Diane's on and Sue's on? I don't see Joel, and I know that Andrea is going to be absent. Is that correct, Michelle? That is what I currently see as well. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. I think Joel probably join us here momentarily. This is the September 28th, 2021 board meeting of the Board of Water Works trustees. We have on our agenda day, starting with a consent agenda, minutes for the August 24th, 2021 Board of Water Works trustees meeting, the minutes for the September 7th, 2021 planning committee meeting, minutes for the September 14th, 2021 finance and audit committee meeting, and the minutes from the September 14th, 2021 Board of Waterworks Trustees meeting. Uh, there's financial statements, a list of payments for August 2021, a summary of CEO approved expenditures in excess of $20,000, and the scheduling of our next meeting date for October 26, 2021. Is there a motion to move the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. And a motion and a second. Any comments from the board or from you, Ted? Nothing for me, Graham. Hearing none, uh, we'll do a roll call vote on the consent agenda, Michelle. Okay. Um, Joel has not signed on yet. Andrea is absent. Gillette? Yes. Upper? Yes. Mons? Yes. Thank you. Great. And this is a moment in our meeting where we recognize members from the public who may want to address us on topics that may or may not be on our agenda. Is there anyone here from the public that wishes to address the board? Graham, we, we did have a, a request um, to share information with the board today about uh, the Polk County uh, Water and Land Legacy Bond referendum that is, is upcoming. And so we offered uh, Luke Hoffman and uh, Ryan Crane the opportunity to share a brief presentation here during the public comment period. So if there are no other members of the public who wish to speak, I would um, suggest that we offer Luke and Ryan the opportunity to, to share um, some information about the bond. Great. Luke, Ryan, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much, Ted and Graham. Um, what I would like to do at this point is just quickly share my screen for a PowerPoint, if that's possible. Sure. Um, I may need to be made a co-host, but let me just make an attempt to share that and make sure everybody can see. Can everybody see my screen here? It just popped yes. up, yes. Great, great. Um, as Ted mentioned, it'll be myself and Ryan Crane of West Des Moines presenting today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody about this really important issue. Um, so I'm Luke Hoffman. I'm the campaign manager for the bond. Um, I work with uh, Mark Langan at Greenwood uh, Media um, and uh, Ryan Crane is our outreach co-chair along with Pat Bodie, who could not make it here today but sends her regards. Um, and just to kind of kick it off, as many of you might be aware, um, just as a bond overview, this is a $65 million bond and it's all about water quality, river protection, wildlife and nature preservation. Um, in particular, also flood mitigation, outdoor recreation and trails. So there's a whole lot packaged together that is on the table for this bond. Um, our campaign team is a bipartisan group of volunteers from the public, private and nonprofit sectors. So we made some very intentional effort to make sure that each of our chairs, which I'll go over um, uh, later, you know, has Republicans, Democrats, independents, uh, and is from across various different industries. Um, so uh, in you know, noting that 73% of the public voted last time in 2012 uh, when we passed the bond originally, um, we see that support has actually ticked up and I'll go over some polling as well. 
here in a minute in the presentation. Um, but our mission is to support the needs for water, habitat, land, parks, and recreation, which is, as you well know, very well aligned with um, your mission. Um, and just real quick, I'll turn it over to Ryan to kind of go over our campaign chairs since he is one of them. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> well, you're, you're kind, uh, Luke, to, to tee that up. Thank you. Um, two, uh, two good close friends over many years to the water quality space, or at least two, um, Pat, Pat Bodie, of course, uh, being prior Iowa Environmental Council, Iowa DNR, uh, Mark Ackelson, um, another uh, luminary in, in the field, um, Tom Levis, uh, of course, um, whose role I actually uh, now have uh, as uh, Angela Connolly's uh, liaison to the Conservation Board. Um, of course, he was a, a, an attorney who cared a lot about uh, outdoors and water quality. Um, and then uh, uh, Chris Hensley and Jerry Nugent round out our uh, campaign chairs as the finance or fundraising chairs uh, for the cause. Uh, Luke, I'm sure we'll touch on this later, but our goal, um, you know, we are closing in on our goal very close uh, to raising $350,000, uh, which will provide us uh, the footing to mount a very targeted direct mail campaign uh, a, a TV ad buys and, and some social media and, and digital campaigns as well. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so the five reasons that everybody here should just as voters support Polk County Water and Land Legacy, uh, number one is water quality stewardship. 38% um, of the funds of that 65 million would go towards water quality and also flood mitigation, um, which is mentioned here, protecting wildlife habitat, which we also know helps with preventing flooding. Um, and then also specifically protecting the watershed around the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers and their tributaries. And then finally, kind of to wrap it all together, quality of life for everybody and future generations. So those are the five main reasons that we're really pushing forward for folks in our messaging to support this. Um, I'll let Ryan talk about um, Polk County's water and land legacy as far as the cost and the benefit and a little bit more as far as how the bonds operate. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, you know, bonds, uh, no stranger uh, to most of the folks in this group and how those work. Um, it is a 20 year bond, um, which would be leaded uh, for um, f over a span of 20 years uh, to the conservation board, as well as the uh, supervisors would kind of jointly um, be uh, issuing. Um, the cost of this referendum or, or the cost of this bond uh, for homeowners would be less than $12 a year, about 91 cents per month, um, and would extend or would outlay um, the issues that, that Luke just covered, those those being the reasons uh, to be supportive of the bond. Um, you'll have to forgive me for a moment, my screen. Ah, there we go, I got it. Um, and then the, the leveraging power is something we're actually very excited about. Um, not only uh, our state and federal funds uh, being loosened up, uh, with some of the congressional appropriations that we're seeing. Um, but uh, an example, uh, in, the, in the last bond that we did in 2012, uh, on the end of it here, we had uh, Rick Jurgens, uh, prior CEO of Hy-Vee, uh, and Bob Meyer, former uh, CEO of Casey's, uh, come together and do some very quick and incredible fundraising uh, for uh, accessibility, um, you know, and all access, um, uh, uh, um, amenities, I guess you could say, uh, for folks that are differently abled uh, at Easter Lake. Um, it includes rowing. Um, it includes um, accessibility to enter the water there at Easter Lake. Um, and two, you know, uh, fundraising juggernauts uh, that decided to kind of seal the deal uh, on that important project at Easter Lake. And that's just an, that's just an example of, of some of the dollars that we anticipate will be leveraged with this $65 million bond if it passes. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, moving forward here, um, some 2012 bond projects that you might recognize that were incredibly successful that we wanna highlight. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, we have Easter Lake, um, which I bike around frequently. It's a very beautiful area. You got Jester Park Nature Center, um, very beautiful as well, Four Mile Creek and others. So there's a lot of projects that are, you know, signature projects coming out of the 2012 bond that we find um, like I mentioned, the public, uh, there's broad consensus there, um, and these are very recognizable, and people associate them with Polk County Conservation and Polk County Conservation Board as being a trusted government entity, which you'll see later here when we share our polling. Uh, moving forward to kind of the community partnerships, so, 
You know, you also see projects like Browns Woods being something where we're um, where Polk County Conservation is partnering through this bond. Um, the uh, Trestle Trail, environmental education, uh, connecting different trails, and also water monitor uh, water quality monitoring are also part of this. Um, but kind of a, a snapshot, a pie chart, if you will, here um, of the proposed 2021 distribution of the bond. So um, 25 million uh, would be towards water, water quality, flood mitigation. Um, parks uh, would be 20, 20 million, land would be 15%, and trails there with another uh, 15%. So that, that's something I can share as a more detailed follow-up if anybody's interested in looking at the official breakdown from Polk County Conservation. Um, and then I'll turn it back over to Ryan here for some 2021 signature projects that are proposed. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, we are very, very excited. Uh, Sleepy Hollow, um, just making news in the last week, two weeks, um, the acquisition of Sleepy Hollow from Polk County, a big winter recreation and, and winter amenity there that we're excited about, as well as, of course, the seasonal camping at the Iowa State Fair. Uh, it's an important revenue generator, but it's kind of a blur, uh, kind of a blip on the on the calendar for the 12 month cycle there. Um, trails connecting communities that was in the business record, I believe, just today or yesterday. Um, the importance of that uh, project, um, you know, connecting um, in, in the north side of Des Moines proper, um, Ankeny, Polk City, uh, different things getting networked up in there. Um, Copper Creek Mountain Biking, another example of one-to-one uh, -one matching or, or you know, uh, dollars uh, being leveraged. Um, some impressive grassroots fundraising. I think they raised something like thirty-five or forty thousand dollars just in hundred-dollar chunks and fifty-dollar chunks out there. So very, you know, very easy to see that there was a need that was not being met um, that was, you know, matched up nicely with grassroots fundraising. Um, and then to round it out, water quality, water trails, um, water um, restoration, um, just water, water, water. Um, if land acquisition and bike trails was was the subject in 2012, it's water this time around. And, and I think that there's a real appetite for, for some change and for some improvements in that regard. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take us quickly through um, polling that we did. This was conducted May 3rd through May 6th. So well prior to us launching the campaign uh, right after Labor Day. Um, and so here are some of the polling takeaways that I just want to share with you, just showing the broad consensus that I mentioned. 75% uh, when read just the bond language as it will appear on the ballot with the yes, no for November 2nd favored a $65 million bond costing the average homeowner $11 per year over 20 years. Um, and then going to the next slide here, 89% favored the bond if it helped prevent flooding, which as we know, a lot of these funds will be used for flood mitigation as mentioned earlier. So that was a very uh, high, high watermark there in terms of the polling, 91%. Nice pond, Luke. Thank you, <laughs> I you would, would, would notice it. 91% uh, favored the bond if it protected drinking water sources. This is by far and away the highest mark that we see. Um, I don't know who the 9% are that didn't favor clean drinking water, but what I can tell you is our campaign is all about clean water. Our logo and branding and messaging are all about clean water for Polk County. So you'll notice that our website here, uh, as mentioned with vote yes for Polk Clean Water, it's just polkcleanwater.com. Um, so you can look at that website that's live right now and it, it lists all of our different endorsements. We have over 50 endorsements of different individuals and community organizations. And then 75% um, supported the measure if the funds were only used for the stated purposes. Um, this is also part of our messaging. So um, baked into this bond are accountability mechanisms that help give trust to the public and to the voters knowing that these funds um, can only be used for the purposes that are stated in the measure as it appears on the ballot. Um, and that is means it's subject to an annual public audit and other different accountability mechanisms that are baked into this. And finally, 73% trusted Polk County Conservation specifically as the government entity that will be allocating these funds and be very involved in the projects that come out of this um, to spend those funds wisely. So I think you know, in a world where we're so divided and there's so much partisanship, this is where I see a glimmer of hope for our community where you see people actually trusting local government to get the work done, to do the projects that are needed to move the needle for our community. And you can be a part of this by supporting the effort. Um, so I'll let Ryan kind of bring us home and how you can support us. Yeah, I think the biggest one um, is in the middle there uh, for this group. 
um, agreeing to be publicly listed as a supporter of the bond um, on the website, uh, your your credibility, uh, your name is is very uh, <laughs> it carries a lot of weight. Um, helping uh, support the campaign through a donation, though, um, is another uh, important way that you can help. Um, and we do have uh, an ask um, in front of uh, uh, we we do have an ask in front of you for that. Um, and and forgive me for for not circling back with Luke on on the front end on that uh, important ask. And then educating and informing uh, your membership. Um, we know that you have a lot of eyeballs and folks pay a lot of attention to what you do and what you put out there um, in your own materials as well as your own social media, um, your own voice. Uh, you know, Polk County Conservation um, is fully behind this project. You know, as Luke pointed out, um, we are trusted uh, to maintain, to steward, to manage. Um, and, and I know that um, the foundation oh. there, sorry. I know that the foundation uh, it also has a very good reputation. So we hope that this is kind of a, a mutually uh, beneficial uh, in endorsement um, that, that you all uh, do agree to endorse uh, the project, but then also know that uh, Polk County Conservation will have your back and this, these projects will be stewarded and managed with um, you know, our, our excellent reputation. Great, and then that concludes our presentation. We really appreciate the opportunity to get in front of your group and would appreciate any support you're willing to give. Great, gentlemen, thank you for your time. Any comments or questions from the board? Not hearing any. Gentlemen, really, we appreciate your time and your efforts on this. Thank you very much. We, we believe this is gonna be a game changer uh, for Polk County and just to continue the excellent projects that have, uh, you know, a continuation of the excellence that folks are getting used to from, from Paul County Conservation. And, and we appreciate the time very much. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Jen and Ted, you'll keep us posted on what we need to do is, is or if there's anything we need to do on this. Yeah, absolutely, Graham. We'll, uh, we'll circle back and, and uh, uh, bring anything to the board. I. Have to apologize or admit that I'm not aware of, of any ask currently, so I'll have to look into that and follow up. But um, uh, we will keep you posted. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else here from the public that wishes to address the board? I have no one here in person. Thank you. Graham, I can I just yes circle back to this last issue because I think time sure. is of the essence on this um, measure that's you know going to a vote in November. Uh, what would be the plan, Ted, for making the board aware of, uh, first of all, signing on so they could use it in the material and then secondly, whatever the ask is and bringing that forward? So I, uh, I'm gonna think out loud here a little bit because um, as I said, I, I, I was, uh, I'm not aware of the ask, so I'm not even sure how to respond to that. I don't know what it is or how much it is or wasn't aware that there was one. So I apologize for that. I must have, I must have missed that. But um, uh, typically um, this is the kind of thing that we would bring uh, before committee and have a discussion um, I think it would be something we could bring to the Finance and Audit Committee next uh, two weeks from today, if uh, um, the board is so inclined. But I would uh, suggest that staff take a, a look and um, I see that uh, Luke has a comment here that he can speak to that very quickly. The question about the ask, I assume, Luke. Please go ahead. Yep, apologies for not mentioning that during the presentation. My understanding was that uh, Hannah, um, our PAC chair, was gonna have lunch with you today to speak to you about that, Ted, but that the ask is for $20,000. Um, we're happy for whatever support you're willing to give, but that would really help us close the gap in terms of getting to that 350,000 that we have budgeted. Um, right now we're at 274, so that would really help us get closer to that $350,000 that we aim to raise for the total amount. Um, but with that, I'll let y'all decide how to move forward and how to proceed. And I'll go ahead and hop off. But again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So Ted, this is something you could maybe bring to finance and audit. And if we need to expedite that, you can figure it out at that time. Is that what you're thinking? I think that's the right plan, Graham. I, I, uh, we, we can talk more about it. When I visited with Hannah today, she asked if they, if we, uh, supported this kind of thing generally financially. And I said, typically not. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. So if okay. the board would like more information, we'll be sure to bring that to finance and audit. Sure. I'd like to know, since this is a, a Polk County effort, if the other communities are contributing and the other water boards, I mean, I, I absolutely support the measure. I don't have any question about that. It's the financial support and using our customers' money to influence a public vote that I would just like more information, whether we've done that in the past and whether that's something we typically do. Yeah, I, I can certainly share that we have not typically done that in the past, Diane, but I think it's something that I can look into further and I need to do that. I, I I'm apologize for being unprepared today, but um, <laughs> okay. on the direction that that was gonna go, so. Like I said, I'd like some information on the other communities. Absolutely. We can look into Diane, that. Diane, I share your concern about using our customers' money to support a, a ballot measure. I'm, I'm not sure that's appropriate, but I'd be curious, you know, what, what's been done in the past and what our, and I'm not saying we have a policy on that, but just what staff thinks of that. And maybe an even lower threshold that I'm curious if we have taken an official position on a ballot measure like this in the past and um, you know, as an initial matter, just starting to think about whether that's even appropriate. Um, I, I'm less concerned or I'm less troubled by that than giving money, but still want to give that some thought. So if uh, staff has any historical context, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I, thank you, Joel. I, again, I will, we will do a better job of preparing, you know, my, my knowledge on this subject is not very deep, but I do recall um, when, when I will came about, there was some reluctance from, the, from a board perspective to endorse that kind of thing. We certainly heard and supported the types of initiatives that were co being considered, but specifically to endorse a, you know, a, a sales tax sort of a thing. I, I believe the board decided not to do that, but I, will, I need to find out. Um, I'm uh, unprepared today, but we'll be better prepared at Finance and Audit. Ed, when you also check on that, would you find out what opposition is out there? Um, to the measure? Absolutely. Excellent. All right. Anything else on this item? All right. Hearing and seeing none, we will move on to our regular agenda. And agenda item 3A is not to exceed $10 million. Oops, my screen just went. Sorry. Um, $10 million water revenue refunding bonds. And this is a public hearing. So with that, I will open the uh, public hearing on this item and um, see if there are any written or oral objections of the issuance of not to exceed, exceed $10 million water revenue refunding bonds. Are there any written or oral objections? Graham, I can report that we have received no written objections. And I don't see anyone here in the audience that wishes to speak on this. So with that, I will close the hearing. Um, maybe um, before I take the motion or roll call vote, maybe you could just walk us through this, uh, Ted. Yeah, Graham, I think that's a great idea. Um, we've talked about this uh, both at uh, Finance and Audit and at the August board meeting. These bonds are uh, were originally issued in 2006, I believe, to fund the construction of Sailorville Water Treatment Plant and the Joint East Side uh, Booster Station and Tower. Um, most of this debt is debt that's actually held by um, our suburban wholesale customers related to purchase capacity in Sailorville. We have some total service customers who um, hold some of that debt for the Joint East Side facility. These bonds were actually refunded once before. Um, they are now the 2012 B is what we've referred to them as. They were most recently refunded in 2012. Um, we talked about the potential for refunding because of about a $330,000 savings over the remaining life of the bond. Um, since last we talked about this, 
Um, we have reached out to the other participants in this bond issue, and we have received verbal commitments from all of them uh, to participate in uh, redemption as opposed to refunding. They've all indicated that they are interested in actually paying off their share of the bonds. Um, that's certainly what we intend to do. We think that's the best course of action, but we have been advised by Allers and Cooney to proceed with this step in the refunding or refinancing process, just in case there are any complications or anyone of the wholesale customers decides that this is not the appropriate time for them to refund or to redeem, pay off the bonds, that we will have taken this important step in, in the refinancing process. So um, we are actively working with the other participants to secure their payments, assuming that all of those payments are received. Uh, we will just move ahead with uh, redemption of the bonds uh, next month instead of um, refunding of the bonds. But um, still recommended that we go ahead and take this step of um, approving this um, resolution as a part of the refunding process, just in case that's where we end up um, at the end of the road. So before I seek any questions or comments on this. I'm looking for a motion to adopt a resolution instituting proceedings to take additional action for the issuance of not to exceed, exceed $10 million water revenue refunding bonds. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And a second. And we have a second. Are there any comments or, oh, yes, I second. Do we have any comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, I'll ask Michelle to take a roll call vote. Ashburner? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Pepper? Yes. Munns? Yes. Thank you. All right. Item 3B is award of Des Moines River intake roof structure modifications. This too is a public hearing, so I will open the public hearing uh, for comments from the public regarding the form of contract plans and specifications and estimated costs for this project. Are there any comments from the public on this, Ted, or anyone here? We have received no comments from the public. All right, and seeing no one here, I will close the public hearing and seek a motion for adoption of the form of contract plans and specifications and estimated cost. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. So moved. Second. I have, I have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions before we take the roll call vote on the motion? Seeing none, Michelle, will you record the vote? Ashburn? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Upper? Yes. Months? Yes. Great, and then Ted, I'll let you walk us through an analysis of the bids. Thanks, Graham. Um, we talked briefly about this project in uh, at the August meeting. This is a really interesting project where we are uh, trying to create access in the roof of the Des Moines River intake so that we can remove um, equipment of s significant size, equipment that won't come out through the door. And so um, that equipment has reached its useful life. We, we bid the project. Um, we had several prospective bidders take out plans, but we did uh, receive just two bids, um, one from Henkel and one from Woodruff, as you can see on screen there. Uh, Henkel Construction is, is the, the low responsible bidder, and uh, they, having completed numerous projects successfully for the Waterworks in the past, staff would recommend that uh, the board award the contract to Henkel. So I'm looking for a motion to award the Des Moines River Intake Roof Structure Modifications Contract to Hinkle Construction Company in the amount of $311,000 and authorize the chairperson and CEO and general manager to execute the contract. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And is there a second? Second. Motion second. Comments or questions on this item? 
we still see high construction prices, Ted, and no uh, no end in sight, I'm afraid, right? Yeah, I, I think that's the cycle we're in, Graham. Um, this one was actually very close to the estimate, and so we were pleased about that, but um, still uh, contractors are busy, prices are high. We haven't had any problems with, with uh, a contractor not being able to procure the materials they need yet, have we? You know, we have experienced some extraordinarily long lead times. I know uh, we had some issues at uh, the Polk City Booster Station. Um, I'm going to ask Mike to be more responsive to that and let us know if there are any other specific issues we've had with uh, availability. Yeah, we are. The, the lead time is the biggest um, thing that we've seen. Uh, the pump station that Ted mentioned is probably the most um, vivid in our mind. Uh, this is a pump station that we would have hoped to have commissioned and on, online uh, by now. Um, we are on a path now to get it commissioned before um, warmer weather arrives after the winter. Um, and then we hear other smaller stories where there are um, delays. We just today we heard from a contractor that to provide something as simple as an electrical enclosure, uh, these are fairly routine items, but a hundred working days to get a, a three foot by four foot by two foot cabinet. Uh, those mm -hmm. are those are exceptional delays and uh, some of the local uh, fabricators are actually probably going to find a way into our little tiny market to help us with some small things like that. So um, it's kind of hit and miss, but there's definitely a, a risk with uh, lead times right now. So we're just trying to work with contractors as best we can. And Mike, if I'm not mistaken, the Polk City Booster Station, the building is up. It's ready to go. It's, it's specialty valves, pumps, things that go inside the building that are really holding us up. Correct. Yeah, so those kind of specialty items, Graham, are hard to come mm -hmm. long lead times. Well, I'm even aware that there's, you know, there's some common items like roofing pins and other things that you cannot get your hands on anymore. Um, and so it's concerning. And I think that's going to go on for a while. I think so too. Any other comments or questions on item 3B? Hearing none, I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hopper? Yes. Munns? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. And we're moving into our third public hearing. This is the award of the 2021 Des Moines Water Main Replacement Contract for Indianola Avenue. Uh, since this is a public hearing, I will open uh, the public hearing for comments from the public regarding the form of contract plans and specifications and estimated cost. Is there Are there any comments uh, either to be made or have been received, Ted? Graham, we, we have not received any comments from the public. All right, with that, I will close the public hearing and seek a motion for adoption of form of contract plans and specifications and estimated cost. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And, and second. a second. I've got a second from Sue. Any comments or questions? I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburner? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Month? Yes. Hey. Excellent. And Ted, I'll turn it over to you for an analysis of the bids received. Certainly, Graham. This is a water main replacement project that we are undertaking in conjunction with the, the City of Des Moines um, pavement widening on uh, Indianola Road south of Army Post Road on the south side of Des Moines. Um, we're getting in in advance of their project. We have a, an older main there that's undersized. Um, so this is a project that we need to do. Um, we had three bids, good bids, um, all from contractors that we've worked with before. J&K Contracting is the low bid. Um, they've completed a number of projects successfully. Uh, we're, um, the low bid is, is uh, well under the estimate, which is it's a good sign that uh, maybe some things are trending in the right direction, but we would recommend that the board award this contract to J&K contract. 
So I'm looking for a motion to award the 2021 Des Moines water main replacement contract for Indianola Avenue to J and K contracting LLC in the amount of $678,678 and authorize the chairperson and CEO and general manager to execute the contract. Is there a motion to that effect? I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on item 3C? Hearing none, seeing no one raising their hand. Michelle, will you record the vote? Ashburn? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Upper? Yes. Munns? Yes. Thank you. All right. So this moves us to item 3D, request authorization to solicit bids for joint east side booster station hypochlorite feed system and establish the date of the public hearing as the date of the October 2021 board meeting. Before I seek a motion, I'll have you explain this, Ted. Thanks, Graham. Um, this is a project to add chlorine feed facilities to the joint east side booster station. Uh, that was a booster station constructed um, with some of the bonds we're actually going to uh, redeem here shortly. Uh, on the east side, it serves primarily southeast, what was the Southeast Polk Rural System and Pleasant Hill. At the time it was constructed, there was some thought that uh, it may be far enough out into the distribution system that uh, chlorine feed might be necessary, but as opposed to uh, putting in facilities um, that then became unnecessary. We thought we would put the facility in service, uh, which we did many years ago. Um, over time, we've determined that it would be of value to have chlorine feed facilities there so that we could maintain that residual level of chlorine in the water as it's leaving that booster station that we like to see to ensure the, the safety of the water as it moves through uh, the rest of the system further to uh, the north and the east. And so, what we're doing here is, is acquiring um, some equipment and installing it in that existing facility to maintain chlorine residual. So I'm looking for a motion to authorize staff to solicit bids for joint east side booster station hypochlorite feed system and establish the date of the public hearing as the date of the October 2021 board meeting and direct staff to publish notice as provided by law. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. In a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on this item? Seeing or hearing none, I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburner? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Upper? Yes. Munns? Yes. Great. Moving us on to item three. E, a request authorization to issue purchase order for replacement RO membranes for Sailorville, Sailorville Water Treatment Plant. Uh, Ted, I'll have you explain this. Graham, uh, as, as the board is well aware, our Sailorville Water Treatment Plant is a dual membrane facility, and we're going to talk about both kinds of membranes today. Um, all of the water moves through a set of UF membranes, and then a portion of the water moves through uh, RO membranes, which uh, reduce nitrate concentrations and hardness of the water. Uh, our, the, the membranes in both cases, the ultrafiltration and the reverse osmosis, membranes are basically a wear part. They have a, a, a fairly short life, uh, three to five years, and at the end of that useful life, uh, the effectiveness of the membranes decreases in, in those membranes have to be replaced. Um, in the case of our RO membranes, we have a very specific uh, type of membrane, a manufacturer and a model that we have based the design of our treatment plan on. Um, we uh, use those membranes each time we replace the, the RO membranes at the plant. Um, the good news is that there are a number of suppliers who can source those membranes and supply them to us. Uh, we did go out for bids to replace um, uh, one set of membranes here. You can see there a summary of the, the uh, quotes that we received. 
and we are recommending that the, the board authorize staff to issue a purchase order to consolidated water solutions uh, for this set of RO membranes. So I'm seeking a motion to authorize staff to issue a purchase order in the amount of $138,180 to consolidated water solutions for purchase of replacement reverse osmosis mem membranes with a three-year prorated rated warranty for the Sailorville water treatment plant. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And second. I have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on this item? I have a question, Graham. Um, I know over the years since we've had this plant up and running, we've gone through um, various types of membranes, et cetera. Have we, I, I appreciated you saying there are several vendors, but I also remember at the beginning, some were working better than others and we were getting better um, yields out of, for lack of a better term. Have we tried the consolidated water solutions membranes? You know, consolidated water solutions, Sue, is, is just the vendor. They're selling us these, I think it's a Dow Film Tech membrane, Mike. Correct me okay. if I'm wrong there. Yeah, there's the Dow Film Tech. I can't, I don't know if she's got the exact part number in here, but it's a specific no, I, RO membrane. Yeah. But Thank you. I will say, Sue, that the, the those Dow Film Tech membranes have, have worked pretty pretty well for us, the RO membranes. Membranes you're referring to are on the next agenda item, the, uh, the, the UF, the ultra filtration membranes, which um, because of the configuration of the plant are, are really kind of a sole source membrane that we have to get from um, the, the one vendor who originally it was Xenon and then GE purchased Xenon and now it's um, somebody else. Suez. Suez now owns that technology. And so we did have some pretty significant challenges with those membranes initially. We worked through that. You're recalling that we replaced them all on a warranty claim. And then we got um, uh, long-term um, favorable pricing. We took advantage of that to the greatest extent possible here a year or so ago and replaced a lot of the membranes. And now we're back just to replace you know, one skid worth. We have had much better success with those membranes in subsequent um, generations of the membrane, I think is the answer to your question, but that is the UF membranes, um, which will be the next agenda item. Um, these ROs have been uh, have provided pretty good performance for us throughout, I would say. Mike, would you agree with that? Uh, agreed. Thank you for that additional info. Yeah, great memory there, Sue, on our trials and tribulations. Any other comments or questions on this item? Seeing, hearing none, I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Upper? Yes. Munz? Yes. All right, Ted gave us a little bit of a preview of item 3F. This is request authorization to issue purchase order for Sailorville, Sailorville Water Treatment Plant Ultra Filtration Membranes Replacement. Ted, what do you have to add to this that you haven't said already? Yeah, you know, Graham, I, I think we kind of covered it. Um, we are past the, the, the kind of warranty reduced pricing for membranes. We did take advantage of that and now we're into this cycle of replacing membranes as needed at full cost. Um, Suez is the one vendor that we have available to us. Uh, in this case, we uh, negotiated the price uh, that you see there for the membranes and we're recommending that the board authorize us to issue a purchase order to Suez for these membranes. So the motion is to authorize staff to issue a purchase order in the amount of $570,600 to Suez Water Technologies and Solutions for ultra filtration membrane replacement. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. I have a motion and a second. Second. Any comments or questions on this item? Hearing none, I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Upper? Yes. Munns? 
Yes. Excellent. Moving to our final item in this uh, agenda and this part of the agenda, this is the urban deer hunt. We've talked about this a little bit in some committee meetings, but I'll have you explain this, Ted. Yeah, thank you, Graham. We did have a, a presentation on this. The Polk County um, provided a, a representative to share with us about the Polk County Deer Management Task Force and, and their efforts over the last um, 15 or 20 years uh, in maintaining a, a healthy deer herd in, in Polk County. Um, as you're aware, um, Waterworks did participate in the urban hunt for a number of years um, from the late 90s up until about 2012. Um, in the late 90s, we had a very large deer population. Uh, aerial survey data showed uh, populations in the mid 50s in terms of deer per acre, or uh, acre, heavens, heaven forbid, deer, deer per square mile. And uh, Polk County considers 20 deer to be a more healthy uh, population. And so what we saw was uh, a lot of deer were leaving the park um, in the evening, in the morning. Um, there were a number of car deer accidents. There was a lot of, of uh, damage. And so Polk County was very interested. Deer numbers dropped throughout those, those many years of participation. We were seeing uh, deer numbers in, you know, in the single digits you know, eight, nine, that kind of number per square mile in the, in the counts um, in the early 2000 teens, 11, 12. Um, we did suspend our participation in the urban deer hunt at that time. Um, deer numbers have increased. Again, they're back over uh, 20 deer per square mile um, on a pretty regular basis in the um, surveys, they do an aerial survey, they fly all over the county and they, they just literally count the deer. Um, I will say uh, 2021, 2019, um, 2019, 2018 were uh, mid 20s per square mile. The 2021 data, I'm not sure when they did that, but it was a little bit anomalous. It was a pretty low number. Um, doesn't align with what we see in the park, but Anyway, based on the trending, um, Polk County is very interested uh, in Waterworks once again participating. We've had a couple of park neighbors reach out to us and, and urge us to reinitiate our participation. So we have looked into that. Jessica Barnett and, and her staff have done what I think is a really nice job of setting up uh, uh, some deer hunting zones. There's a map included in the in the board packet for your reference, um, you will notice that we are not allowing deer hunting uh, in any of the areas adjacent to, to George Flag Parkway this time around. That's an area where we did have some complaints from neighbors who didn't like being able to see hunters from their backyard decks or whatever. And so we've just excluded those areas. Uh, we've also put in some um, blackout dates is what I call them, but opportunity for us to just shut down hunting if there's a, a large event in the park or something else going on like the marathon or any event that might bring a lot of people to the park and especially areas of the park where hunting will be allowed. Uh, Jessica, I think has done a great job of, of um, ensuring that um, our guidelines that will be shared uh, with, with our uh, potential hunters are, are clear about the, the qualifications, the, the testing, the law, licensing, everything that's expected of them uh, if they are going to um, participate in, in urban deer hunting here in Waterworks Park. We're going to have a shortened season. Um, normally the urban hunt starts the first of September and runs through the end of January. We're proposing an, an October 1 start for this year. A total of up to 11 hunters. That doesn't mean there will be 11. That's just the maximum there could be and they'll be spread out pretty broadly through the more remote zones of the park. So um, we've taken a pretty close look at it. We've tried to address some of the issues that we've had historically, uh, which were few, I will say, uh, but we, we've tried to address them by, by limiting the areas and providing for these blackout dates. And uh, we are recommending that the board authorize uh, controlled bow hunting to occur in Waterworks Park again beginning on October 1st. 
All right, so the summary gives you uh, much of the dates and the details that you need and attached documents to as well. But I'm looking for a motion authorizing the CEO and general manager to allow controlled bow hunting to resume in Waterworks Park as recommended by the Polk County Deer Task Force. And again, the dates are provided in the summary. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And a second? Second. Any comments or questions on this item? Graham, I, I do have a question. Um, I appreciate knowing that Polk County is involved in this and because we sit within the city limits, I'm just curious, do we also need to make the city of Des Moines aware or the neighborhoods? So the great questions, and I, I should have um, been more specific about that, but the city of Des Moines is, is very involved in this process. They're, they participate in the, in the deer management program in a number of their parks, areas around the airport, um, other areas, non-park areas in the city. So Mike Gall, I think is the gentleman's name, who has um, even helped us. Uh, he's from the city and he's helped us set up our program to some extent. Uh, Jessica has also reached out. I see Jessica is still here. I'm pretty sure she's reached out to neighborhood associations. Um, Jessica, do you want to comment on any interactions you've had in that regard? Sure. Um, I reached out to several uh, neighborhood associations and got a few responses, not from everybody, but just a thank you for letting them know. Um, I also reached out. Talked with Sam at the Park Foundation. Um, he really had no issues except for when they have large events in the park. And then also talked with CETA and the stables that adjoin us to the north. And uh, really no concerns from anybody on any of the hunt. Just more aware of when the hunters were in here, the dates, how we were handling the permit process, things like that. Which neighborhood associations? Which ones did I contact? Yes. Um, I can send you that list. I don't have it in front of me, but I can send you that list. But uh, the neighbors to the south, to the north, uh, there was, oh, I think four or five of them, but I can send that to you. Thank you. Um, Ted, just a couple of comments. I appreciate all the very thorough information and what I see is really um, thoughtful rules and guidelines um, uh, for this operation. Um, I think I'm looking at the map and I, I think it makes a lot of sense if there's one zone that I think um, I'd encourage your staff to keep an eye on and just see how it goes. If it would be zone two, where I think there's a possibility for, you know, there's a lot of equestrian activity and I know a lot of dog walkers, um, you know, use that area I like to park down by the stables and kind of do some of those loops there. I don't foresee there being any problems, but I just, I think those are some of the um, of the more isolated areas, I think those are seem to me to be some of the more used ones. Um, so maybe an, an area to just keep an eye on and see how it goes and potentially rethink or you know evaluate in the future. Absolutely, Joel, we will certainly keep an eye on that. Um, you know, the, I think the rules will help ensure that we have only very experienced bow hunters. So, um, you know, we, we, uh, we want to absolutely avoid any, any confusion in terms of uh, equestrians or dog walking or that kind of thing. But um, we'll keep in touch with the, with the stables and make sure they aren't experiencing any problems and um, just keep an eye on it in general to make sure that there aren't any issues. And I worry less about, you know, confusing a, a dog for deer or stray arrows or anything like that. I think your rules and uh, the qualification standards do a really good job of ensuring that won't be an issue. I'm just thinking more about people not knowing this is going on and, you know, being startled if they come across a hunter who's field dressing a deer, or uh, I know you have a rule for, you know, how to, how and where to dress a deer. Um, I think that's smart, but just potential for more encounters uh, between hunters and the general public, I think, in that area. Understood. I see Sue has posted a comment here about um, insurance. I'll have to look into that, Sue. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm confident that our insurance does not specifically mention hunting, but I'm also confident that it's uh, pretty inclusive in terms of 
kinds of activities and, and things that might happen in general. But we can certainly make sure that there doesn't seem to be a gap there. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Ted, uh, I anticipate that you will keep us posted on um, how this works, the numbers of deer that are uh, hunted, and I anticipate this is something that will probably come back to us next year or so. Some sort of an update as the hunt goes on this year, and obviously at the, at the conclusion at the end of January, I think would be helpful. Absolutely. We, we certainly get reports on um, the, the progress of the hunt. We can share those probably most effectively at the end. Great. And uh, also any concerns, complaints, questions that we might get throughout the process. Great. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, I'll have Michelle record the vote. Ashbringer? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Upper? Yes. Months? Yes. Thank you. All right, that, ex that uh, concludes that section. We move now into information items, which include board and committee reports. And Diane, I believe you are the planning committee representative tonight. Here, I need some, I need to be refreshed on what we did at planning, because I can't remember. There Diane, we covered the, the new website. Um, we, there was a review of our, our new corporate website and then also a review of our new hydraulic modeling software. Just two uh, informational updates were shared. Yeah, and I would encourage everyone, I don't know, if, to um, look at that new software. I can really see that there'll be opportunities um, for more efficiencies, but possibly for other uses as time goes on. That was a fairly really interesting new modeling. It's very powerful um, software. Um, yeah. Like, like so many, we'll have to realize the capabilities and put them to work, but it's- uh, Yeah, yeah. I hope that, that other departments will be shown what the capabilities are. So if they have ideas for how that may be useful elsewhere, it would be a, a good, cross training kind of thing, not to learn how to use it, but to know its, its functionalities and capabilities. Understood, absolutely. Excellent, uh, Joel, Finance and Audit Committee. Yes, I think we were all there. If I can keep this brief, we discussed the 2012 revenue, water revenue bonds and the potential for refunding or redemption. And we also discussed the 2022 water rates. Excellent. Um, Sue, I don't know what you'll have to add on customer relations. I'll ask Ted to also chime in on where we are in regionalization. But Sue, do you have anything to add on customer relations before we have Ted give us an update? No, I don't. I think the most recent meeting, you and Diane might have more information or Ted. Sure, I'll let Ted speak to where we are. Absolutely, Graham. We had a, a what I think was a good meeting with representatives from the West Moines Water Works and the Urbandale Water Utility a couple of Fridays ago to, to uh, um, come to conclusion on the remaining outstanding issues that were left after the micro group had met for um, a number of months. Um, we did come to conclusion, which is I think a very positive outcome of that meeting. Now we're in the process of updating the outcomes document. We need to share that with representatives from Urbandale and, and West Des Moines. I'm sure we're all on the same page. And then I think we can begin uh, moving forward with sharing that um, amongst the, the other Metro um, wholesale customers and communities so that they have an understanding of, of the structure that at least the three of us have um, come to some conclusion on. We are also um, hard at work, and I, I, I use the term we loosely, Rick is hard at work um, in drafting the, the ultimate 2080. There are a number of sections of that document that will fall to staff here to help complete, but, but Rick has been sharing bits and pieces of that with me um, over the last couple of weeks and reviewing and, and updating based on the outcomes of the meetings that we've had. 
so that uh, when the time is appropriate, we'll be ready to start sharing that agreement for review and, and comment. So um, those are the things that are going on. We're in the process of, of updating those, uh, updating the outcomes document, creating the 28E document. And then um, when those are ready, we will um, begin moving those documents out and sharing them more broadly. I just want to add to that, that we recognize that, that any understandings that came out of that meeting will have to be circled back around and go to the individual boards for their agreement. Excellent. John Landy, anything else to add there about the process or? Uh, no, I, we, Rick and I have been working on, on harmonizing provisions of the 2080 and making sure that it's internally consistent addressing everything. So um, we are making progress on that. Excellent, thank you. Um, I don't have anything uh, to report really from the Bill Stowe Memorial Committee. Uh, you'll hear more as I promised before, probably in the October or November meeting on that. Um, nor do I have much to say about the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden, although um, the, the loss of, of John Ruan was felt by the Botanical Garden and the, the Ruans um, forced both of the Botanical Garden and at Waterworks, their participation in the, the Park Foundation with the connector and the, the work around uh, Fluor Drive over all these years, um, his loss was uh, monumental for the, the community. And I think of, think of him in the work of the Botanical Garden and the, and the Park Foundation and, and uh, I know I, you all will join me and, uh, and you already have and, and sending your sympathies to the Ruan family. Um, that being said, uh, Des Moines Waterworks Park Foundation Board. Joel, is there anything to add or Mike? We had a um, visioning uh, strategy session last month, which I thought was really positive. We I discussed the larger vision for uh, the park, the park foundation. Um, Mike, anything to add to that? I, I think the those kind of leading the session, we're going to uh, kind of uh, put together our, our many thoughts we had in that session and, and bring them back to the, the park foundation board with something you know a little more coherent. So I think stay tuned for that. Um, Mike, anything I'm missing? No, that was the focus was the visioning. And I think you're right. It kind of ended um, with the sentiment that Cassandra needed to kind of take all the feedback and summarize it. I will add to that, uh, Joel and everybody else who's interested that Cassandra, who is the facilitator for that um, uh, function for the park foundation is assisting and going to go play a similar role for a small thing that we're going to do for the bill stowe memorial foundation and the reason we did that is we wanted to make sure that uh, the messaging was consistent and the output both from the bill stowe memorial and the park foundation were consistent so um, that's gonna that focus group if you will is going to be a small group of uh, potential donors and others, and we hope to have that in October. So um, I like the fact that she's willing to do that and that there'll be consistency between the two uh, information gathering and, and strategic planning issues. All right, uh, staff updates, Ms. Terry. Thanks, Graham. I have three topics to tell you all about today. Uh, the first one is about our strategic communications plan for 2021. Um, one of our goals this year was to generate awareness at the national level about our surface water challenges. So in addition, you know, we've been talking to federal agencies and congressional delegations. We've also secured several earned media opportunities. Um, we've told you about some of those, but most recently, Ted has been interviewed by Circle of Blue. Uh, which is an international network of journalists, scientists, and communication designers. They report about um, the growing competition between water, food production, and energy. You can follow them on social media. Uh, Ted has also been interviewed by CBS Originals and Paramount Plus for a TV show that will air in January. 
Um, we also had a photographer and interviewer out for the national magazine or newsletter of the Sierra Club, which will um, come out in January, where the featured um, article in that. And then I think it's tomorrow morning, Ted has an interview with Bloomberg Opinion for Bloomberg News. And those are all going to be about our surface water challenges and, and what we're doing to try and combat those and, and plan for the future. Uh, the second thing is we continue meeting with state legislators during the interim and the outreach is resulting in some tour dates in October. So uh, we'll be hosting two groups of state legislators who sit on the Ag and Natural Resources or Ag Appropriations Committees in the House and the Senate. Um, we're going to tour the facilities and then have a Q&A and brief presentation with staff. So um, those invitations won't be going out from us, interestingly. They'll be going out from some of the senators and representatives, which is great. Norlin Momsen from Clinton was out recently, and we also met with Rep Representative Momsen is from Clinton. He visited us here, and then we met with Senator Rosenboom from Oskaloosa recently. So they're going to be doing the inviting, so that's cool. Uh, really quick, too, we did a couple of tours in September. Uh, one was with Iowa State University Extension and Iowa Learning Farms, and they had a ton of really good questions. And then we also hosted a group called the Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance. So thank you to the board members who also attended that one. That is a nonprofit group made, made up of the Iowa pork producers, the Iowa corn growers, the Iowa Soybean Association, and I think that's it. Uh, so that was a, an interesting discussion with them. And then the third thing is, um, I let you know a few months ago that um, we are launching what we're calling the Iowa Nutrient Collaborative for Public Water Supplies, which is an idea that came out of a conversation that Ted and I had. Um, <clears throat> there are nearly 50 public water supplies in Iowa that are required by permit to blend or treat for nitrate. And so we came up with the idea of establishing a core group that will create sort of a community of public water suppliers that struggle with nutrient pollution. So our core group of industry leaders um, was from the Iowa Association of, water, Association of Water Agencies, the Iowa Rural Water Association, Cedar Rapids Water Department, Rathbun Regional Water, Ames Water and Pollution Control, and the City of Lakeview. So it's really an interesting cross-section of uh, of partners in this space. And then we have agency advisors from EPA Region 7 and also the DNR. So we've been meeting for several months and now we've hammered out a charter um, which talks about the goal of the collaborative is to work with other stakeholders to do two things, to promote drinking water source protection and lessen the impact of nutrients on our surface and groundwater. So the kinds of activities that we envision being uh, involved in would be elevating the urgency around reducing nutrient loads. We sometimes hear in the news, we just need more time. We just need more time. So we want to let people know that, that this is an urgent situation. Also education and training for drinking water professionals. And then we wanna develop communication strategies for outreach to landowners and the public and also to legislators about the urgency of the situation. So it's not just Des Moines Water Works um, delivering these messages and educating the public and others. It's people across the state. So I co-presented at the Iowa Association of Water Agencies annual meeting a couple of weeks ago about this with uh, a couple of other partners in that group. I'm presenting again in Cedar Rapids at the American Water Works Iowa section conference um, at the end of October. And then in November, our core group, group is meeting here at Waterworks, and we're going to chart our course for the next probably 18 months of what we think we want where to go with the collaborative. And we've gotten some input from EPA regions across the country who we're not new to this space. There are other uh, organizations form, that have formed um, in other regions. And so we're learning from them as, as we go along. So that's been really fun. It's been cool. Um, that's it for me, uh, unless you all have any questions. Any questions or comments for Jen? Um, I just, I just want, put it in ahead, the please. chat. But that was impressive. <laughs> nice to get an update like that. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. I keep Ted busy along with all the other stuff that he's doing. I'll chime in on that, Sue. I think that, um, and well, Andrea and I attended the meeting um, after the, uh, the staff gave a tour to the the corn growers and the soybean and the other associations that were uh, that came to Waterworks, and um, you know it's interesting to have, um, and I know that the the staff has worked real hard on outreach to groups like that that we don't always see eye to eye with, um, and that um, you know being in that room, I mean you have people around that table that have strong opinions about. Uh, 
how we should solve, well, frankly, what the problems are and how we should solve them sometimes. And um, what I appreciated about that is Ted's continued focus on finding common ground to, to turn the conversation back to the things that we can agree on and more importantly, the things that we can work on together, which is difficult in a group of highly opinionated people, myself included. Um, and so, I mean, I think that it's, it's an important effort that, that Jen and Ted are undertaking to, to find that common ground. It, you know, Des Moines Waterworks has to lead here more than our size says that it should. I mean, we're in the whole scheme of things, a relatively small utility, um, but the, the leadership role, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, the leadership role that, that this entity is taking in kind of a change in course is admirable. Uh, I don't know how much success it's going to have, but um, you know it's 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 nice to get around the table and at least make the effort to find that common ground. And so I applaud that. Thank you, Graham. I appreciate those remarks. And I would just also um, I don't want to. Um, I want to be sure and mention the part that Melissa Walker, our public relations consultant, plays in all of these strategies. She's been a great partner in the space, and I want to be sure that she gets some credit as well. And I'll say, Sue, in, in response to your comment about uh, common ground, it is important that we find common ground. And it's also important that um, we talk about the difficult issues. And, and, and Ted has done a nice job of that, too, where he doesn't back down from uh, what the problems are. Um, and I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone that was in that room in general. I'm, but there are times where people don't want to talk about the problems. But it's very important to our rate payers, the people that we serve, that we talk about the problems. So they're doing both things, and I think that that's, that's the delicate dance they're doing, and the one that I appreciate. Well, thank you, Graham. Uh, if I might, I'll, I'll move into my comments. If if that. Is okay. Please, we kind of stole some of your regionalization comments earlier, so but take which, it away. Is, which is just fine. I, I just I will follow up on the, the conversation about external affairs and, and add that Jen and Melissa have done a great job of getting our story in front of the national media, and they are interested, Agreed. and they are coming here to hear our story frequently. And when we when these it will be interesting to see what happens when those um, stories start to drop and be published and be shared um, on, a, on a wider stage. So, <clears throat> you know, we're trying to tell our story, which is um, hard to argue with and hard to deny, but um, thanks to Jen and Melissa for making that happen. Um, and I do think <laughs> uh, Graham and Andrew did a, a very nice job of, of sitting in a room with people who really disagreed with them and being very constructive and positive about it. So appreciate the support there. Uh, I think that was a good meeting. Um, quick COVID update. I, I want to say, I want the board to be aware that we are pretty much business as usual. I mean, we still have mask requirements. We still have um, some folks working in, in, a, in a slightly different place and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but the, the office is open. Everyone is is back to work. We're we're doing we're we're doing what we do um, pretty successfully. We don't have significant impacts right now from a COVID perspective in terms of exposures or or positives. Um, we're in a pretty good place. We are what I in what I would call a wait and see mode here on the vaccination mandates and and testing. Um, we have uh, not done anything beyond simply um, poll our employees and find out. Um, who's vaccinated and, and who's not. And we're waiting to see where things fall out on a national level in terms of um, what the requirements might be and what should be our next step. We're also paying close attention to Polk County because as I'm sure you all know, they did implement a mandate uh, that by the 30th of this month, which is just around the corner, uh, Polk County employees need to be vaccinated or need to participate in regular testing. Still don't know where that testing is gonna take place or how it's gonna happen, they may well know, but I, I haven't heard. But uh, we are, we're keeping a close eye on the situation and, and waiting to see. Um, as Graham mentioned, we already talked about regionalization. I uh, don't have anything else to add to that right now. Um, and the last point I will make 
is related to the drought, the drought that is ongoing and is continuing to affect us every day. Um, the rivers continue to drop. The Des Moines River actually is, is ab about where it normally is this time, just based on the, the, the placement of rains and when they've occurred, it's flowing about 500 uh, CFS, which is pretty typical for this time of year. The Raccoon River is, is not typical for this time of year. Um, we're seeing flows on the Raccoon River below 50 CFS on rare occasion. It bounces around a little, mostly based on how much water we are taking. We are taking a large percentage of the river flow out of the river. At this point, uh, there is a river gauge at 63rd Street where the water enters uh, the Waterworks Park on the west end. And that gauge is currently at the lowest level it has ever been at in terms of flow on the Raccoon River. Now that gauge is only about 24 years old. So this is not a historic low on the river certainly, but it's the lowest that, that the Raccoon has been at that point, at least in the history of that gauge. Um, we're, we're managing right now, I would say. We are not currently using the Des Moines River because we continue to see persistent low levels of microcystin um, in the 0 0.5, 0 0.4 sort of range compared to the health advisory of 0 0.3 parts per billion. We haven't seen the spikes uh, yet this year that we have seen in the past two years, in the past five out of seven years. So that's very positive. Uh, likely the, the Des Moines is usable today if we need it. We may well need to use the Des Moines in the next week or two if we don't get any rain. Um, it is incredibly dry and uh, it's, it's not causing problems, but it's certainly causing challenges. So um, I think I'll stop there, Graham, unless there are questions about any of that. So, but related to regionalization in the drought, if we were unsuccessful with um, uh, regionalization and West Des Moines and Waukee were to build their second plant and that we had a similar drought like this, they wouldn't be able to draw much water during a summer like that. Is that correct? That is correct. There is a trigger in that permit that requires a reduction in withdrawal from the river from 12 MGD to 2,000 gallons a minute, which is about 3 MGD, so from 12 to 3. And that trigger has been tripped this year. So in a similar drought today, that plant would be restricted to no more than 2,000 gallons a minute out of the Raccoon River. So potential again, and let's put too fine a point on it, but without regionalization and you had a competitive market like this, those being served by that, that second competitor or that second competitor would face some really difficult decisions and there could be a real shortage of water. They'd be coming back to us in effect to, to, to meet their demand. Either coming to us or, or looking for an alternate source, be that a gravel pit or you know something else. But um, I think this just kind of punctuates the fact that it can happen. A drought like this can happen and it can be extended. And finding an alternative source to manage through a situation like this would likely be challenging and expensive. Forgive me for preaching to the choir, but I mean, this is why we've all done the hard work we have to figure out a regional solution. This is why we are very supportive of working together. Yep. Rick, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, anything else for the good of the cause here today? Not hearing any. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second? And a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night.